We can win this war. We can win this war? OK, well, joining us from Orlando, Florida, is the man in that clip, Anthony Dream Johnson, who says he wants to abolish feminism and make women great again. No, but it also crazy. says, with a trademark, make women great again. Full women are always, always great. great. Right. Make women great again. But they're going to do a three-day seminar for women led by all men. <laughs> in mansplaining news, a three-day conference for women led by men hopes to make women great again. How the 22 convention will make you the greatest you ever. Raise your femininity by 500%. First of all, how is a man supposed to tell a woman how to be the ultimate woman? But women need to be taught how to be great again. Oh, Not my yes, words. We do. Like how to land a husband, <gasps> how to lose weight, how to pop out a bunch of kids. Why do men think they need to fix the problems of women? Well, it says the world's ultimate event for women. Yeah, Orlando, Florida, that's going to be the scene of the crime. It's mansplaining palooza. And say no to the toxic, bullying, feminist dogma. <laughs> Taught by men to make women great again. Taking the stage now is the founder of the 22 Convention. You're in for a treat, Mr. Anthony Dream Johnson. Anthony Dream Johnson. Anthony Dream Johnson. The first president of the manosphere. It's run by all men, Surprise. which promises to, quote, make women great again. This course is guaranteed to raise your femininity by 500%. Together, we will make women great again. Excuse me, I'm mansplaining here. She said there's nothing... Welcome back to the 22 Convention 2020 of Orlando, Florida, being held for the first time in history at 21 Summit. And of course, in and of itself, 22 Convention's brand new, Make Women Great Again. Our next speaker is a very good friend of mine. He's been speaking at our events for men and fathers for a couple years now, starting last year at 2019 at the first ever Patriarch Edition. He's actually a father and patriarch of four, based over in the west coast of Florida. He drove all the, all the way over here to Orlando to speak to you women today. His speech is titled, Make Women Wives Again, although typically he's known on YouTube for making men strong again. He actually has over two million followers. He's one of the biggest YouTubers in Florida and the United States, around the world. An amazing man, a strong man, and a strong father, and a radical father, just like his dad. His dad's a badass, too. Anyway, without further ado, please let me welcome, for the first time ever, to the 22 Convention stage, Elliot Hulse. Thanks, buddy. Thank you, and thank you for joining us for such a unique uh, type of conversation. Men talking to women about women stuff, right? So my, the title of my talk here today is Make Women Wives Again. It seems to be a, people aren't getting married anymore. Uh, a big part of what I do is I teach men how to be strong. Um, but as a result, we also have the other side where women don't necessarily need to be strong like men, but uh, do the best that they can to be the best wives they could be if marriage is going to work. So that's where I get my title from. Before I continue, or before I go on, I just want to tell you a little bit about who I am. Uh, Elliot Hulse, I'm a strong man, I'm a strength coach. I have a gym called Strength Camp. I teach men how to be strong. That's what I do, that's what I am. Uh, I have over two million YouTube subscribers. Um, that came about from a long process of starting at the bottom and, uh, and working hard. I started training athletes out of the back of my van using trash, uh, used tires, sandbags, barbells. Uh, I would train them in the parks. And uh, it was a tough time, you know, I had a family and we were deeply in debt and I just stuck with it and I was able to pull us up out of the gutter, training people with trash to that shiny golden button that they give you when you get a million subscribers. Uh, so I train men how to be stronger physically, of course, I'm a strength coach, but I also mentor to their hearts and to their souls. And so a big part of the reason why I was successful on YouTube is because I have a lot to say in terms of how to be strong men in their lives. I've also 
married my high school sweetheart. This is myself and Colleen, my wife, uh, when we were 14 years old. We started dating in 1994. So we've been together for 27 years. Uh, we just celebrated our 18 year marriage uh, anniversary. And uh, that's us now. And that's our family. We've got, I got three daughters and a son. So we're kind of good at this. We kind of know what we're doing. And we're going to talk today about you know, how, we, how we go about having such a wonderful, long-term relationship, marriage, family. Uh, and I'm going to offer you guys some insights as to you know, how, what makes Colleen a unique wife, what makes Colleen a great wife, what makes it so that we can last so long. So I, have a, I get a lot of questions from young men. That's what I, you know, essentially I do on YouTube. They send me questions, I answer their questions. They call me Yo Elliot. Yo Elliot. And I would you know, ask me a question and I would answer it. Well, every once in a while I'll get a question from a young lady. And uh, so about a year ago, actually exactly a year ago, I got a great question from a young woman. She wanted to know, Elliot, what are the top four qualities you appreciate about your wife that young woman as myself can grow and develop? So uh, I, I wrote a blog post. I thought it was a great question, and I really wanted to do my best to deliver as much value as I could to answer her question. So I wrote a, a pretty long blog post called The Making of a Good Wife. And uh, if you want to go read it later, you can do that. But my entire talk here is just basically reiterating what is in that, on that blog post. So the first thing, so what I did was, before just giving those four points, I had to set a little bit of a background that makes our situation unique, Colleen and I's situation unique. Uh, number one, because we, got, we started dating at age 14, so that means we skipped the whole promiscuity thing, where we weren't out there having sex with lots of other people throughout high school and college and in our 20s. Uh, and science has shown, you know, this is a study from the Teachman Heritage Study, you, know, you can go look it up or whatnot, but essentially what you're seeing here is, all the way on the left, is what happens when you marry your first. When you marry, your first sexual partner, the, the chances of, the, of, uh, of staying married is all the way up there. That's about like 87%. As your sex, the amount of sexual partners you have before marriage, you know, the amount of men you have sex with before you actually get married, starts to go up, that percent, that, that chance of the marriage working out consistently goes down. You can see over there towards the bottom, when you start getting into like 16 plus sexual partners, the chances for marriage working out significantly drops. It goes down to 17%. So we go from 87% down to 17% by having a whole lot of sex. Uh, there is a, there's a lot of talk in terms of pair bonding in this intersexual dynamic understanding. And it just so happens that the more, women, the more men a, a woman has sex with, the lower her ability to pair bond, to really bond with one man. You might ask yourself, well, why isn't that not the case for men? Like, you know, feminism has it like such that men and women are supposed to be the same, but we're not. It's just not the same way. This is what happens with women. And so there's a really good, a funny saying that goes around in terms of this that, what do you call a key that opens many locks? A master key. What do you call a lock that's opened by many keys? A shitty lock. So the whole, whole idea here is that for women, you had to protect yourselves. Before there was birth control pills and abortion, women had to protect herself from being, un, being opened by anyone at any time because ultimately, that would make her very vulnerable to pregnancy. Uh, today, because you got birth control pills, we can bypass nature completely, and we see the result of it. Women are having lots of sex before marriage, and marriage is not working out. So there's a, you know, a big part of the reason why our marriage worked. 
we were kids. Uh, you know, my daughters are about the age, <laughs> which is a little scary, scary that they're the age that we were when we started dating. Um, and as a good dad, I explained the very same things to, to them that, uh, you know, it's better to be chaste. Uh, number two, we play or take on traditional gender roles. Uh, another thing that feminism has sort of twisted here is that there's something wrong with women being wives. There's something wrong with women being mothers. There's something wrong with women being in the home. And that it's somehow superior to go and work for some other man and make some other man your boss, that you have to do everything he says, but your husband is somehow your slave master. And it's no good to be at home serving your husband and your children. Uh, you're, it's better to be out there conquering in the world, where that totally is untrue. It's been untrue in our, in our situation. And a big part of the reason why our marriage works is because we take on and carry our traditional gender roles. We know our roles, and we play our parts. Um, there have been studies where uh, they would look at what they would call egalitarian societies and situations where they would give men and women an equal opportunity to go work wherever they wanted, either in the field or in the home. And just based on our natural predispositions, as time went on, even though everybody got the equal opportunity to do what they wanted, women just began to gravitate towards the home. Men just gravitate towards the field. It's not a social construct. It's not something that was made up to oppress anyone. It's just our nature. It's, you know, it's, it's, it works better this way. So anyway, traditional gender roles for us mean that she's a stay-at-home mom. It wasn't easy, and I'm going to talk to you about that. Not easy in our day and age. It was definitely a scary thing to try to do, not have two, two parents working, but it was the best decision that we ever made, and we made that decision very early on. Also, I come from a traditional family. My parents are from Belize. Neither of my parents uh, were brought up with the, yesterday I called it ideological subversion, the brainwashing that's happened to our culture as a result of Marxism. Uh, my parents are from Belize. They grew up in the jungle, so they just, they go about things naturally. So there were traditional gender roles in my home growing up. My mom was a mom. She did wifely, motherly things like cook and clean and caretake. She's not an oppressed woman. That's the other thing I want to bring up also too. My wife is not an oppressed woman. She laughs all the time when she hears this notion that because she follows my lead and she works in the home. By the way, now that our children are a little bit older, she, she actually works for me. She's my assistant. She handles my customer service. So, but. If she was out in the world doing that, she would be considered, you know, successful. Wow, you're doing it. You're working out in the corporate world. But because I'm her husband, somehow, many people believe that she's oppressed. And I get a lot of comments on Facebook because I put up stuff that triggers people in this way because th this kind of thing triggers people. And they're constantly right. I feel, I feel sorry for his wife. And she just laughs because she's like, my life is fucking amazing. Why wouldn't I want that? And that's another thing I ask myself, too. I'm like, I ask... Well, why wouldn't you want a situation where you get to do what you've been designed to do? It's a, it's a luxury. It's an, it's a, uh, it's it's a luxury. Like you get to care for your children. It's a necessity, in fact. So you know, I'm the outside the home breadwinner, caretaker, or uh, provider, protector, and she's the the home the home builder. So I just wanted to, before I move on to the next point in our relationship, I used this slide yesterday when I was talking about ideological subversion in terms of how we've grown so degenerate in our culture. And uh, I, wanted, I, I had to point out that feminism has a big part to do with it. And so in terms of you know, the conversation that we're having right now about traditional gender roles and this whole swap, because we really live in diabolical, disoriented times where things you know, right is wrong, wrong is right, uh, men are women, women are men, uh, everything is completely backwards. It seems as if it may be some sort of progress, right? Like women are progressing because of feminism. 
Well, if you really look at the numbers, and you saw the one that I showed you before, all that sex is not helping women. Um, if you really look at the numbers of what was quote unquote achieved by feminism, it's not a win for anyone. Of course, it's not a win for men, but since progress has come to this point, over 60 million abortions since 1973. Make of it what you will, it's baby killing. I really boil it down to it, you could use any fancy term you want, but killing your babies is not a good idea. It's not a good thing. It may seem like a win to some people, like somehow that makes you powerful, but just think about what that even means. My sense of power because I can murder my baby. I have the right to. It's not good. That's just, that's not just my opinion. I believe that's a fact, but nobody wins when babies die. Not 60 million. And they're not, it's not, about 0.0001% is rape. And that's what, you know, they want to come, use as their point for why abortion should be allowed. It's for entertainment. That's really basically what it is. And so I can have as much sex with unprotected, uh, unresourceful sex with as many unreliable men as possible so that I can then kill my baby. Uh, anyway, so of course I'm passionate about that, but I'll move on. 52% of single uh, women are single. We're better together. And you'll see that we're better together as we move on. Being strong and independent and having over half of women not being able to pair bond and marry and live a life with a man is not a good thing. We're having a, we're having a lot of problems in our society as a result of the breakdown of the family. This is a direct uh, reflection of the breakdown of the family. No more families. What do we do? How does a society grow? How does a society worth anything if there's no more families? 25% well, now check this out. 25% are taking mental health medication. Right? It's screwing people's heads up. 45% of American children are born to unwed mothers. Uh, I showed a I showed a chart yesterday about how damaging that is to children. Most children that come from a single mother home, just when, you know, their mother, they have so many more problems. They're more obese. They're more, they have more attention deficit disorders. They do worse in school. Their incarceration is higher. Every single case of mass school shootings that have happened in the past several years the boys are from homes with no fathers. This is, that's because it's better that they have fathers. So anyway, <laughs> go figure. 67% of marriages end in divorce, right? But 80% of them are initiated by women. So you think divorce is this, you know, sort of this, equal, this equaling the playing field thing for men and women, but it's not. It's mostly women leaving their men leaving their husbands, destroying their families, strong and dependent. Now, 93% of alimony is paid for men to women, so you can leave your man, but you can take all his money. It doesn't go the other way around. So if women are so strong and independent, why, do they have to, why is that the case? Why isn't it the other way around? Well, 83% of women receive primary custody of their children. Those may seem like wins, but number nine says 72% of inmates in state prisons were raised by single mothers. So having babies, taking the money, taking the baby, is only putting your children in jail. It's not helping anyone. So feminism, congratulations. The other thing that we have also is shared vision. From the time we were kids, we kind of have a, God has graced us in so many different ways. And I can't, you know, I'm trying to pinpoint the various things that make us different, but a lot of it has just been complete grace. We're blessed. From the time we were kids, we were always dreaming together, she and I. You know, very rare is it that somebody gets together with their lifelong partner from the time they were teenagers. But I remember her, like I would, we would do homework together and she'd be signing her name, Colleen Hulse, just over and over and over again, Colleen Hulse, Colleen Hulse. Meanwhile, you know, her, her name was Martin, that was her main name. But we were children and dreaming about, I remember our yearbook, our high school yearbook, I, I laid it out, it's as strange as it is, but I laid it out that I'd be marrying Colleen, we're gonna have eight kids, and, we're gonna, and I'm gonna be a strength coach. Well, we have four kids, so I got halfway there as a strength coach. But it was just this matter, I think 
of course, like I said, the grace of God, there are a lot of things going on here in terms of just our personalities and the, and the weird way things unfolded in our lives, but we've always been on the same page. It has never been a matter of competing with one another. We never let our individual ambitions. I'm not out there trying to be ambitious so that I can be better than my wife. Everything that I do is because we're a team, right? I played football my whole life. We're a team. I'm taking one for the team. And the same thing with her. It's never been for her a matter of my own path. She doesn't have her own path, right? That may sound scary or misogynistic or something, but why would she want her own path when she's got a teammate like me? Everything that she does is a matter of the shared vision that we have for one another. And it's the same for me. So here are the points that, uh, that I made to the young lady in the blog post. Um, Colleen follows my lead. She loves to follow my lead. She wants to follow my lead. If I ever waver or, or I'm lukewarm in terms of what needs to be done, she immediately checks in with me like, is everything all right? Because you're not making the, the strong decisions. Now, it's not only about making the strong decisions, it's about making decisions that need to be made, but she's afraid to make. Gen generally, women are more interested in safety and security. Men are more courageous. We're more in terms of taking risks. We're risk takers. It's what makes a good man a good man, that he's willing to take risks. An alpha male takes risks. That's what you understand. But in our world where women rule the roost, essentially feminism reigns, uh, a lot of times the woman's fear rules the, rules the relationship. So I see so many instances where a guy wants to start his own business or you know, he wants to quit his job and start his own business or he wants to you know, do something great for his family, but it's huge, it's scary, it's hard, and he doesn't do it. Why? My wife won't let me. Your wife's fear, which is normal and natural, women should have a, a, a healthier, more for, a stronger, bigger form of fear than men. It's just evolutionary biology. You were more vulnerable than men, and you got to take care of these children. You're walking around nine months with this thing in your baby. You got to be a little bit more cautious. But you can't let, as a man, you can't let that run the relationship. There are a lot of really difficult de uh, decisions that uh, I've had to make, and scary things that I knew that she was just shaking in her boots and didn't want to do, but she was still willing to do it. This is just one example of it. Recently, we started uh, firearms training. And she was scared shitless of touching a gun. Even when, you know, many years ago when I brought one into the house, she just, I don't like it. I don't like it, but I trust you. You know, that's her whole thing. I don't like it. She'll do that. I don't like it. But I know when she says, I don't like it, it's because she's afraid. It doesn't mean she doesn't trust me. I don't like it means I'm so happy I have you to take care of scary shit like that. Well, it's taken a few years, but we've gotten to the point where now she could, she, Actually, this weekend, she's out with her friends now. She's, she's showing them how to shoot. This is just Colleen's way. She will, I take her on the adventure. This is one of the things I said to her when we were in high school. I said, life is going, if you're going to hang with me, <laughs> you know, I've always been a little bit arrogant. If you're going to hang with me, life is going to be an adventure. It's going to be a roller coaster. Sometimes it's going to be hard. And if you're willing and you're down, let's go. And she's been down for the cause. And any, I come up with some of the craziest things sometimes. I'm not always right, but she's... 99% down for the cause, and then afterwards, wow, I'm so happy that we did that. I have a good track record. So following my lead also helped us create the type of life that we have. Uh, she, we both graduated from college. She was making more money than me. She was a school teacher, and I was a personal trainer, and she had health insurance, and I was an independent contractor. And when we discovered that she was pregnant with our first child, uh, I was really getting into natural, I, I started discovering, the internet just came out basically, right? that's how old I am, um, and I started reading up and learning about natural parenting, natural childbirth, natural child rearing, and it actually brought me back to re-traditionalizing my mindset and, my, and you know, the, way, the type of family I wanted to have. I wanted to homeschool and all that, and um, as a result, she, we decided, and she followed my lead, she quit her job as a school teacher with all of its benefits and its higher salary and trusted me to carry the weight. Like I told you, you know, now things are going great. Now 
But in the beginning, I was training people with trash in the parks. It was not easy, but she was willing to follow my lead, and there was some tough times, and she was willing to struggle as a result, but she wins. When you trust your husband, especially if he's got a good track record, if you're with him, you're with him for a reason. You must trust him. Don't have sex with a man that you don't trust. Don't marry a man that you don't trust. Why are you there if you don't trust him? And it's been our experience that when she yields to my leadership, it turns out greater than either of us could ever imagined. Another one was in terms of debt. You know, we had a lot of college debt. We had a lot. Of, at, so, at one point, we were buying our groceries on credit cards. We didn't have enough money to, to, to buy food. So we racked up a ton of credit card debt. We were uh, underwater in terms of our mortgage. It was way over our heads. And I, being a courageous, strong leader in the home, decided we're going to get out of this. And I wasn't making enough money to get out of it. We were $90,000 in debt at the, mo at the time. And I made a plan to pay more per month than I possibly could ever. I was mo more than I was even making, but I, you know, I had a big vision here uh, to get us out of debt. And she followed my lead. It took us about four years, and we complete, got completely out of debt. Uh, and then, oh, her short hair. I know that women are attached to their hair. Men love women with long hair. She had long, pin straight hair. Beautiful, amazing hair. But I just loved her neck so much. And I always imagined that she would look amazing with short hair. And as scary as that was, even for her. And I didn't force her. I don't force my wife to do anything. She, like I said, she loves to follow my lead. She wants to make me happy. She decides to cut her hair. And I think she looks amazing. Displays gratitude. My wife never takes me for granted. And I, I'm simping for my wife here right now. I, I get that. And maybe one day this all turns around and, and bites me in my butt. I have no idea. You know, it's God's will. Whatever happens, happens. But, and I, you know, I'm kind of breaking some rules here. But the woman never, ever takes me for granted. It's been 27 years. The most said word in our home between she and I and between our children is thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you must be said at least 100 times in my house every single day. Well, this is a picture of my children doing some artwork. Uh, I remember very early on, you know, this is an older picture, but this when I had one daughter, uh, very early on, uh, when I was working hard, trying to get us out of debt, trying to build our business, and she was at home, you know, with one in the bun, one in the oven, and nursing the other one, uh, I was met by my daughter at the front door with a piece of with a piece of artwork, you know, some crayon scribbled piece of paper, and it said, "Daddy, thank you for working so hard to give us a great life." And of course, my daughter didn't write it. Colleen wrote it. And my daughter drew some like flowers and grass and trees and whatnot, you know, kids do around that. And I always remember that. And I think, in, you know, I have this picture here of my kids doing crafts because she always reminds them to thank dad. I mean, that's even another, that's a weird thing too. Like, it's really weird for couples to be grateful for each other and to verbalize it. I, we don't see that. I don't know. Our friends don't do it. Her friends don't do it. And all her friends are divorced now. So pff, go figure. But then also, children can children can be ingracious. They lack gratitude. You don't have children because you want them to thank you. That I figured out. <laughs> There's no, it's a thankless job. But my wife will, and both ways, you know, I always, whenever Colleen cooks, she cooks every night. After saying grace, thank you wife, and each of the kids, thank you mom. And so we remind our children to be grateful to, she, she reminds them to be grateful to me, I remember, remind them to be grateful to her. So we're grateful for each other. And we don't take, other, take each other for granted. Meaning, <laughs> anything could happen. And I don't take her submission and her willingness to follow my lead and the work that she does in the home the laundry and the cooking and the cleaning and caring for the kids, I take none of it for granted. I totally recognize what she's sacrificing to be in that place. And the same is 
for me and her. I mean, we have a nice life now and she spends my money, but she doesn't take it for granted. She recognizes and she knows, she remembers when we were on food stamps. So she's grateful to me and she thanks God. We don't take it for granted. And, she, and one of the things she likes to say, she'll like, it's weird. We've been together for, since we were 14 years old. We're 41 now. She still blushes. <laughs> she still blushes around me. She'll blush and say, I'm a lucky girl. You know, sometimes when we're having a great dinner or something wonderful has happened in her life, she'll just like, she, she has this look of awe on her face where she's like, I must have been a good girl. I'm a lucky girl. She recognizes she's a lucky girl. And I'm not trying to put myself on a pedestal, but when a woman displays that kind of gratitude and is gracious in that way to her husband, the husband can't help but to simp on her. Can't help but to like, wow. Men want to be respected, women want to be loved. Show your husband respect, thank him. You're lucky to have him. Think in those terms. A lot of times, because we live in diabolical, disoriented times and everything's backwards, it's usually the other way around. We put the woman on the pedestal and it's like, you know, I hear guys say things, I love this one, and I, I throw people all the time when I walk in somewhere and my wife was usually with me, but she's not with me. They go, where's your better half? I'm like, you mean my left arm or my right? She's not my better half. Or they would say your um, various, I can't remember, I can't think of all the colloquial terms that are associated with why I'm lucky to be with my wife. That lopsidedness is deteriorating to the sense of self and ego to the man, and it makes a woman think she's more important than she is. We're both equally important. Content with little, Colleen. Like I said, we had some really hard times. And she never, and to this day, even though things are so much better, she never is needy for luxury. She never looks at other, other families or other people and wonders why we don't have that, why I don't have that. I used to almost think, you know, because we're taught that our wives should be like men, we're taught that women should be like men, and I used to wonder sometimes, this is just her nature, and I used to wonder sometimes, why isn't she ambitious? Like, I'm so ambitious, like, I want that stuff. I want to go get it. And she never, she was like, oh, okay. And I knew other women who were ambitious, because, you know, they bit the apple. And Colleen just never compared herself to them. She never wanted what they wanted. She never forced me or denigrated me for, she knew I was working hard, but it was never about getting more stuff from Elliot. Uh, this is a picture of Colleen's dream car. So uh, our first car when we moved to Florida was a hand-me-down. My grandmother gave us her car, which was a little white like Escort, Ford Escort that uh, at one point got smashed up and it just stopped working. I mean, she drove it smashed for a little while. And then it just stopped working. And, uh, and but we were, our, our family was growing. I think at the time we had two kids already, a third one on the way. And uh, we knew we needed a, a minivan. And she like, there are not too many things that Colleen wants. <laughs> like I said, she's content with little. That's probably why it works. One of the reasons why it works. Um, but she saw this Kia Sedona. <laughs> and we laugh now, and I'll show you why we laugh now in a minute. We laugh now, but this was Colleen's dream car. I paid $5,000 for it, and it was a lot of money coming out of my pocket at the time. I, you know, it was one of those situations where we buy the car or do we keep the lights on? Well, we need the freaking car. So, content with little. Another story I like to tell is, uh, you know, we're, it's not much, it doesn't take much to make us happy with one another. We know, now we do date nights like every weekend. And, so, and when I started making money, I used to like, I used to worry that she would take me for granted. It's never happened up until this point. Um, but now that I'm making money and we spend lavishly, we go on date night every Friday and we'll, you know, dinner's not cheap. We don't go to cheap restaurants. Um, but backtrack 15 years ago, when we never went anywhere because we, didn't, we couldn't afford it, we had a couple from our church that recognized, you know, this is a young, struggling couple, 
they decided, why don't we come over and watch the kids for you one week, one night? And they did that, and we, it was nice, but we were like, where are we going to go? We don't have any money. We're not going to do anything. And so Colleen surprised me by buying a six-pack of beer, and she made some meatball heroes, and we went to the beach. Doesn't, doesn't take much. She doesn't require much. Doesn't argue with me. Colleen does not argue with me. She does not fight with me. She, doesn't, she never gets hysterical. You never see her get upset about anything. And, uh, and a lot of times I'm wrong. And that's the crazy thing. You know, she's willing to allow me to be wrong. Especially, you know, there are times that, as a man, this is just our, our nature. It's my nature. I don't know. But we got to assert our dominance. And, you know, things were going good in our lives. And there was a point, I look back now and I realize what I did, but I was giving so much to my family. And I was like, I don't give anything to myself. I was feeling selfish. I was like, I don't do anything for myself. Everything I get, and I, it's really what I want to do. But I got sidetracked for a moment that really what I want to do is give everything. I want to give everything to my wife. I want to give everything to my children. It's just, I think it's in most men's nature. If we're playing our traditional gender roles and being our strongest selves, most men will honestly say, I just want to give you everything. And of course, women are designed to receive. Just don't steal it and run away. Right? That's what divorce court's all about. Well, anyway, you saw our dream car there before. Well, a couple years ago, I decided I want my own dream car. I bought this Tesla. I colored it my favorite color, and it was very, very expensive. And Colleen will voice her opinion. She, never, she doesn't not voice her opinion. She just won't fight with me. She won't argue with me, and she won't force me, even if I'm wrong. She'll wait for me to figure it out. And it's happened time and time again. And there are times where it's happening, and I'll even say, I'm probably wrong, and I'm probably going to figure it out, but I have to do this anyway. And she'll say, what? Uh, so she thought it was a bad idea to go buy a $100,000 car. <laughs> I was like, I'm getting it. So she bit her lip and she let me do it. Well, the car was a beautiful car, had all kinds of freaking problems right from the get-go. I'm spending all this money for this car and it's glitching all over the place. We had just moved into this house, so you know, I think that was a part of my like almost like my jealousy. Like I bought this house for you and the family. And like I didn't even have an office in it. I was like, wait a second, what am I gonna do? So I went and bought this freaking car. Problems with it from, since the beginning. And then I realized having a house and having this stupid sports car is incompatible. I have, I'm, I'm doing gardening, I got landscaping, I'm doing repairs, and I can't carry anything in this stupid car. I'm paying a lot of money for this and it's completely unfunctional. So, she, and here's the thing, so then I sold it and I got a pickup truck, of course, because that makes more freaking sense. Colleen never said, I told you so. Never rubbed it in my face. Never said anything about it. When I sold it, she just said, that's a good idea. She never even said, that was my idea. But it was hers. Uh, so she won't even fight with me when she's wrong. She's a good wife. Loves God for my sake. Colleen's not as religious as I am, and I don't think she needs to be. She recognizes that I receive my authority from above. I'm a Christian, and I seek Christ as my perfect example for how to be a husband. They call Christ the husband of the church, and men are to live, them, live their lives in the same way, with the same example of Christ. And I've always been a seeker and a reacher for God. It's not in her nature, but from the beginning, she followed my lead. We had a beautiful religious wedding. We, uh, I took, we took the children to church. She, again, it wasn't because it was natural to her. It was because she knew that I received my authority and she respected my authority and she recognized that it is better for me to pray along this side, this man, for our sake. And so she loves me, she loves God, and God loves her because she loves me, and that's the way I see it. When we pray together, I recognize that 
she's received the same grace and will continue to receive the same grace that God has poured out on us since day one. So um, one of the things that we do a lot of in our house is thank God. And like I told you, thank you is one of the most over, most used terms in our home. And uh, when Colleen thanks me, especially, especially in the beginning when it was tough, it's, it's, it's easier to be grateful when you have nothing. And so I was a lot more grateful in the early days when there was not much. And she would say thank you to me, and I would just remind her, thank God. And so today when you know, we're paying the bills or you know, we're, we're buy, doing something great for the kids, she and I, and she will say to me, thank you and thank God. So that's, th those are the, I gave five. The girl asked for four. So I gave five things. I gave five things that are unique about Colleen. I'm not here to tell any women how to be what they want to be. But the proof is in the pudding. The women who see this and, are, and reject it and have, uh, are triggered by the things that I'm saying here about my wife and our traditional values and her submission to my leadership, we've got a great life. She's got an amazing life. She loves her life. Most of the women that are triggered by it don't love their life. They've been through multiple divorces. We have family members through multiple divorces. Can't keep a man. They usually end up dying old cat women. They're miserable in their lives. They're usually angry. They're usually angry at their fathers. They're usually angry at men. They're usually, they're usually the, the, you know, the memes with the women that are screaming because of Donald Trump, ah, because they hate authority. They're just rebellious women. And that's what, that's what feminism has done, has made women hate fathers, men, families, destroying the families through abortion, through divorce. I'm not pointing any fingers, but you guys are doing it. What I do is I help men become worthy. I help men become stronger so that they're worth marrying. You know why? Because I got three daughters. And I want them to have strong alpha male leaders in their homes. I want them to marry men like me. So I do my best to get out there and train a generation of men. That's the best that I can do. But at the same time, women, we need your help. Not your help in terms of being strong and independent or, and, and, and contributing with money, but contribute with your femininity. Contribute the way that God designed it for you to contribute by being a helper. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with being the helper to your husband? What's wrong with allowing your husband to be your boss? Because guess what? You're going to go do it out there anyway. It's either some strange man out there, and I'm not a fan of women in the workforce. That sounds horrible these days, but I don't think it's a good idea because guess what? That's, ever since women have went, gone into the workforce, this is where all of the adultery really skyrocketed. Two things that started, that created the massive amount of adultery and promiscuity. The advent of the car, because now you can sneak off and do whatever you want, wherever you want, nobody has to know, and women in the workforce. So you're in the workforce, working for other men and having sex out of your marriage. Why? So anyway, that was, these are the things that have allowed our relationship from the time we were children. And I'm a fan of marrying early. But only under these circumstances. Only with these understandings. Only with a husband or a man and a woman that have these values. It's not going to work any other way. And our culture, yesterday I gave a great talk on the ideological subversion that has brought cultural Marxism, which is the father of feminism, into our culture. We've been completely brainwashed and denigrated, and we live in a degenerate culture, and it's hard not to be a degenerate. I totally get that. We got to go back to traditional values. Tradition, the values that built this country and the values that built our families that built, uh, built this country. And those values, you know, our political structure is Greek and Roman, but our morality and our values are Christian. You don't have to be Christian, but understand 
that when we all have the same moral law, when we all understand what's good and what's bad, what's right and what's wrong, when not everything is arbitrary, when we seek the truth of authority rather than having a rebellious attitude about everything, shit seems to work out real well. Being a rebel, there's no value in it. So to sort of wrap things up here, uh, I bought this book because I really like the, the author, Lori Alexander. She gets a lot of hate because she says a lot of things about feminism and she, does, she puts up a lot of memes and, 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 and advice to women about how to be real women, uh, pre-feminist women, and ultimately what will be the post-feminist movement because as there's a cycle in civilization and at the peak of a cycle when a, a, a society becomes what's called decadent, that's usually when women are at their most flagrant. <laughs> that's when Eve totally swallows the apple and, and Adam is just doing what his wife tells him. And we're there. That's where we're at. And I'm not making any judgment about it because this is just what happens to societies over and over and over and over again. The next step in, our, in this cycle, this predictable pattern, is hard times. And when times get hard, women don't have to be put in their place. They just fall into place because shit is tough out there and you need the protection of a man. You need the provisions of a man. We, you don't need us right now because things are good. There's a saying that goes, when times are good, everybody wants mommy in charge. Times are good, mom's tough. Look at her walking around, strong, independent mommy. Because everything's so easy. Life is easy. But when times are hard, everyone turns to dad to fix the problems. You'll know that in your own family, but it's, it, but it's gonna happen in our society. So get your mind right now for what's coming. It might be in our lifetimes, but it'll definitely be in your children's lifetimes. Things are gonna get tough, and everything that I'm saying right here, right now, if it triggers you, you're gonna say, oh, maybe that stuff will work. Because it will work, because it's a natural order. And when you have the pressures of nature bearing down on you, you go back to what's right. We don't have the decadence that allows you to be so degenerate. So anyway, um, I thought this was a cool book. I bought it for my daughters. And so I want to do it here with the next few minutes. Is she, she has 12 chapters in there. I just picked out a few that have little quippets from uh, scriptures that tell women how to be great women. Be sober-minded. Sober-minded essentially is not allowing your emotions to get the best of you. Don't be, there was a great quote that I said yesterday, um, women today will drink like your father but can't cook like your mother. So I mean, literally, don't be a drunk. Colleen does not get drunk. I don't remember the last time I seen my wife drunk. Don't get drunk and don't allow your emotions or your passion or your anger to carry you away in any instant. I know that there are times when Colleen doesn't agree with me or she's upset with me, but she keeps her cool. You don't want to fight with a man. Well, of course you do now because you can just take him to divorce court. But if you want a marriage to work, don't fight with your husband. Be cool. Let him do what he's got to do, as long as he's not fucking anybody else. And things will work out. There's a, there's a, if you, I'm into, I've studied various forms of martial arts. My brother's into it. There is a tremendous power to yielding. If you, if you know anything about Tai Chi or the various forms of, uh, of martial arts, the power is in the one that takes the force from the other person and redirects it. Colleen totally redirects my force. She, I am a forceful man. I'm a strong man. And she, in her covert feminine way, which is the power that women have, she knows how to not receive my force, but redirect it. She's really, really good at doing that. Because, but the only reason why she can do that is because she's sober-minded. Love is patient. Love is not emotional. One of the worst things that I hear, it, it's horrible when the women do it, but it's even worse when the guys do it. But it starts with a woman's mindset. And a lot of the guys today have women's mindsets. They're raised by their mothers. They worship women. So it's really bad for them. But it's generally going to be the way a woman thinks. And it needs to be checked, which is, I need to feel in love with you. 
in this passage, there, and I don't memorize it, but it's love is patient, love is kind, love is blah, blah. And he goes, you know, St. Paul goes through a series of about 10 different things, what love is. Nowhere in there is love feels good. Love is passionate. Our, now, Colleen and I, we've got a tremendous emotional bond between the two of us. But that's not why we're together. We're together because it's logical. It makes sense. Our love is logical love. And I know a lot of people, never, they don't really understand that when I say that. But we have a heart love, of course. But what keeps the marriage going is a logical love. I'm going to love you with my mind. There's, I love to say that you think with your heart, but love with your mind. When loving with your mind means loving on purpose, not because I feel it. You don't I need to feel love at all. Love is a choice. It's a, it's a sober choice. Be discreet. One of the ugliest things that I see is these couples where they put all their shit out on Facebook. I don't go on Facebook it very often. Colleen does, but she'll point it out to me. She'll be like, look at her putting all the laundry out on, a, on Facebook. Yeah. Right? You know, they're having problems in their marriage or their husband does something. And, and they're out there blasting it to the world. I put along with that also. Don't be what they call an insta-thought. I, I would never want to marry or be with a woman that is constantly advertising her sexuality through sexy posts on Instagram. I get it, that's what women are doing. Uh, women's currency is attention, I understand that, but it does not make for a good wife. <laughs> right? I see guys and their wives, or I see a lot of young men, they're, they're dating this girl, and I'll go to their page, and the page is just full of pictures of them in their bathing suit, looking sexy, like, come and have sex with me. Isn't that, don't you have a boyfriend? What is that? Be discreet. Be chaste. We already showed you what happens when you have all that sex. Stop having sex. Stop having sex with random men, lots of men, men that aren't your husband, men that you're not going to have babies with. I don't believe promiscuity is a good idea for men or women, but it's worse for y'all. Shitty lock. Remember that. <laughs> keepers at home, once again, and I kind of reiterated this a bunch of times because my wife is a keeper at the home. It is the best place for a woman. Why not? From our get-go, from the beginnings of the, the, the advent of civilizations, men dealt with the periphery. We went out to the periphery to protect what? What's inside. Nothing has changed. We go to the periphery. We go out there so that we can protect, provide, work on the outside. Men are outside oriented. Women are inside oriented. When we both know our roles and play our parts, life is great. But when those roles are inverted, we become perverted and it's what we got today. Obedient to your husband. Oh, that's a tough one. First of all, nobody likes obedience to anybody or anything in our degenerate culture. Everybody's a freaking rebel against everything. This is why there's no longer any God. Atheism is the, is the way of the day. Why? Well, I don't need no big daddy telling me what to do. Men and women behave this way. It's totally effeminate, and it destroys the, the, the life of the individual and the family. To be obedient to your husband doesn't mean you're a slave. It means you married a man worth trusting. Do it. Just trust him. Why not? Don't marry somebody. Look, I don't blame you. Don't follow the lead of a weak man. Don't marry a weak man. Don't have sex with a weak man. Don't let a, let a weak man lead you. But if you married him, that means you, were, you must have been prudent in your decision. Follow his lead. Trust him. This is not only because it's good for, it's good for both. It's good for men and it's good for women. Men want to lead. When you don't let us do what we need to do, you know what happens? 47% of men, the, the, uh, the, the suicide rate has gone up 47% in the past 10 years for men. We're killing ourselves, literally, because we have no place. 
men are valued for what they can do. Women are valued for what they are. Right? You're just, women are just valuable because you're women. You're born with what men want. You don't have to do a damn thing. You got it. <laughs> men, we're valued for what we can do. But if you take away what we do, we have no sense of self. And the world has given you opportunities to take away what men are supposed to do, and men are now useless. And so we kill ourselves. Feminism, thank you. Meek and quiet spirit. And this is kind of goes back to what I was saying before in terms of how Colleen will silently bear my foolishness at times. She doesn't try to control me or force me or denigrate me, even if I'm wrong and I'm admitting I'm wrong. And I always go back when I admit that I was wrong. I even, even know that I'm wrong sometimes before I'm doing it, but I got to do it. Because as a man, we have to assert our dominance, right? It's better for us to play that role, better for us to take that fall. Sit back, trust us. You got to trust us, because if you don't, you lose and we lose. And then finally, my last slide. Look, uh, if you want to see it played out in action, follow my wife on Instagram. See our life. See if she's oppressed, <laughs> right? See what feminine luxury looks like when you sit back and allow your man to lead. So you can follow her on at Colleen Hulse. And of course, I put mine up there at Elliot Hulse. If you want to be triggered, pissed off, and, uh, <laughs> and you know, upset about the things I'm saying, go to Elliot Hulse, because I put up a lot of stuff that triggers people. But if you want to see it played out in action, go, go follow my wife. We've got, we got a great family. We've got a great life. And uh, I love it. Done. I got five minutes if you guys want to chat. When you talked about meek, did you mean meek as in scriptural meek? Humble. No, meek in the scriptures. Meek. When Jesus said he was meek, or that Je it was referred to Jesus as meek, it meant that he was like a bridled horse. Very powerful, but choosing to be meek. I love that you say that because meek don't mean weak. <laughs> My wife is not weak. My wife is strong. She deadlifts 200 pounds too. But she's not weak. It's not about weakness. It's about humility. It's about like the bridled horse. It's like, hey, look, I could. Look, here's the thing. Y'all don't have to be meek. Because all you got to do is go to divorce court and take everything we got. We have no defense. They're going to believe you. They're going to take your side. You'll get all the money and you get our kids. Y'all have more power than us. The type of meekness, and when I'm, you know, I'm talking in terms of my wife, she can do that at any moment. right? That's the way the power structure has been set up now. It's fair, supposedly. But the meekness means, even though I have this power, like you say, I have this power like a horse. And she's a Sagittarius too. She's a horse. Uh, you don't lord that over someone. Right. You don't keep reminding them, hey, I can do this. And the same thing, you know, like for a man, look, y'all don't want to hear this, <laughs> but we can smash the shit out of y'all. When it really boils down to it, when it's really the nuts and bolts, we can do whatever we want. Now, of course, you got the state as your daddy now. The state's the daddy. So the state rules the roost. We don't rule our homes. But everything that a woman has is because a man has given it to you guys. There's not a single thing that you have that man haven't, men haven't used our inherent strength and said, we're going to let you have this. We're going to let you have this. We're going to let you do this. We're going to let you have this. Don't forget that. There's meekness both ways. Thank you. Any questions that comes to the mic, please. So, as you're talking about the um, uh, characteristics that your wife has, and you've been with her since you guys were 14, 
What did you do to facilitate those things within her? And what was she doing to facilitate those things within herself? Where did she learn it? How did she learn it? And how did you help or not? One thing I point out is that we were basically married at age 14. And the way, I, the way, the way that happened, and it, you know, grace of God and kind of some weird stuff, but her parents weren't really there. And she ended up spending 90% of her time at my house. So here I was, you know, my parents let me have this girl in my bedroom all day long. And so she not only laid in my bed with me from the time I was a child, right? Weird, I would never let my daughter do that. I think back and I'm like, that's crazy. I wouldn't even let my son do it. But my mom then became her mentor. She was in my house helping my mom cook. She was watching the way my mom was with my dad. She was watching how my mom cared for the children, how she was a home taker. So in a lot of ways, this woman was mentored by one of the greatest mothers. You know, my, I got a great mother. I don't think that could have happened any other, you know, it, it, she wouldn't probably have turned out this way had she not been basically raised with my parents. She saw the way my father was and she, I guess, expected that of me. My dad's a strong alpha male leader. My, my mother is a, is a great caretaker and wife. And my, wa my wife wanted something more for her because her parents weren't there. Uh, and so she, she took that role. So she had a good set of modeling examples that were consistent over a long period. Mm-hmm, yep. Yeah. She was mentored. She was mentored by a Biblical woman. So, that's all. Thank you. Thank you we could win this war. We can win this war? Okay, well joining us from Orlando, Florida is the man in that clip, Anthony Dream Johnson, who says he wants to abolish feminism and make women great again. No, but it also crazy. says, with a trademark, make women great again. Fool, we are always great. great. Right. Make women great again. But they're going to do a three-day seminar for women led by all men. <laughs> in mansplaining news, a three-day conference for women led by men hopes to make women great again. How the 22 convention will make you the greatest you ever. Raise your femininity by 500%. First of all, how is a man supposed to tell a woman how to be the ultimate woman? But women need to be taught how to be great again. Oh, not my yes, words. We do. Like how to land a husband, <gasps> how to lose weight, how to pop out a bunch of kids. Why do men think they need to fix the problems of women? Well, it says the world's ultimate event for women. In Orlando, Florida, that's going to be the scene of the crime. It's mansplaining palooza. And say no to the toxic, bullying, feminist dogma. <laughs> Taught by men to make women great again. Taking the stage now is the founder of the 22 Convention. You're in for a treat, Mr. Anthony Dream Johnson. Anthony Dream Johnson. Anthony Dream Johnson. The first president of the Manosphere. It's run by all men, which promises to, quote, make women great again. This course is guaranteed to raise your femininity by 500%. Together, we will make women great again. Excuse me, I'm mansplaining here. She said there's nothing...